My name is David Rome. I'm a senior fellow here at the Garrison Institute, and today I'm sitting with Evan Thompson, professor of philosophy at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Evan, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you. And perhaps I'll let you say what brings you to the Garrison Institute this week. I'm here for the uh, annual meeting of the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute. And uh, I'm, in addition to my work at the University of Toronto as a philosopher, I'm <coughs> co-chair of the Program and Research uh, Council at the Mind and Life Institute. And so that's involved in the Mind and Life activities. And so I've been part of the planning of this summer institute, which brings together scientists and philosophers and contemplative scholars every year to um, discuss um, and investigate together the nature of mind seen through contemplative experience and practice. Hmm. Great. Thank you. We spoke yesterday with Richie Davidson. He gave some of the early history of the Mind and Life Institute. Uh, w one of the, you gave a talk um, about the career of Francisco Varela, mm -hmm. and uh, in particular about um, neurophenomenology. Mm -hmm. Tell us, for the layperson, what is neurophenomenology? neurophenomenology? Well, neurophenomenology is a word that Francisco Varela uh, introduced into his work towards the very end of his life. And he was very interested at that point in the nature of consciousness, the nature of experience. And the idea behind neurophenomenology was really to bring the latest techniques and methods from neuroscience, so things like brain scanning, um, EEG, together with a rigorous and careful and precise investigation of experience on its own terms from a first-person perspective. So the word phenomenology signals the concern with lived experience described from the point of view of experience or the perspective of experience. Right. And, and his idea was that with more careful and precise phenomenologies of experience of the sort we see in contemplative traditions, that we could advance the science of the mind and the science of consciousness, that this perspective could complement the work that's going on in neuroscience on the, the brain and the, and the body. Mm -hmm. And where does philosophy fit into the picture? We have the, the hard science on mm -hmm. one side, which is very empirical, and then the first person experiential of the meditation or contemplative practices. What's the role of philosophy in this dialogue? Well, the, the, the most general role of philosophy as I see it is to provide a, a, a kind of step back, big picture, reflective look at what exactly it is that we're, we're doing when we try to relate. Uh, the experience, uh, experience and, and the brain and what is going on when we bring different traditions together in such a common project, traditions that have different vocabularies, that use different concepts, um, traditions such as Buddhist philosophy, which underpins the Buddhist contemplative practices. Uh, a lot of Western philosophy today is very much concerned with issues having to do with the relationship between mind and brain and mind and body, so mind-body mind problems, you could say. Um, Neuroscience comes to its study with certain assumptions or uh, presuppositions that, from a philosopher's point of view, might need to be called into question. For example, you know, uh, is uh, is the study of experience uh, only to be related to the brain rather than the wider context of the body and its relation to the environment? And so, philosophers are interested in all these kinds of big picture, big picture questions. Mm -hmm. And Francisco Varela, as a neuroscientist. Uh, was always a very philosophical neuroscientist. He was always very sensitive to these questions. Uh, so that was built into his conception of neurophenomenology. And the mind and life meetings have always had philosophers present in order to, to bring these bigger questions out in the, in the discussions. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe you can clarify for me, just as a layperson, I have the impression that um, phenomenology is something that Europeans do and philosophy of mind is something that Americans and uh, English perhaps do mm -hmm. and that they don't like each other and they don't get along. But you seem to be, both seem to be involved here. Right. Well, I would say that your description was, um, was, was very much true for, for a large number of years, but that has started to change in the past, let's say, 10 or 15 mm. years. Um, there's a new generation of philosophy students and young philosophers who see in Western phenomenology, so this would be the tradition coming from Edmund Husserl and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, continental European thinkers, mm -hmm. they see in, in Western phenomenology uh, a lot of riches and resources to help them address philosophical questions that arise in psychology and neuroscience today, 
particularly because the topic of consciousness, the nature of consciousness, sure. has arisen as a major issue in the past 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And that's been the central topic of phenomenology since its inception. So the phenomenologists have been very, very careful and very precise and very detailed in the studies that they've conducted of consciousness. So there's a great resource there. And it becomes even more complex in a way when you bring in the phenomenologies of other traditions, such as Buddhist philosophy is, is uh, a very phenomenological philosophy uh, in many ways. And so uh, we have a, a kind of complicated discussion that happens at the Summer Institute here among Western philosophers and phenomenologists, the, the Buddhist philosophers and contemplative scholars, the neuroscientists and the psychologists. And I think that's a indication of the richness of the subject mm. matter of consciousness and mm. needing those those many perspectives. And where do you locate yourself personally in relation to uh, all of these traditions? Um, the science, the contemplative mm -hmm. practice, the two kinds of philosophy? Mm -hmm. Well, I have feet in all of them. Okay. <laughs> um, in the sense that uh, my, my uh, scholarly training is as a philosopher. I was trained both in <coughs> analytical Anglo-American styles of philosophy as well as continental European phenomenologies. Um, and in my work as a philosopher, I collaborate very closely with neuroscientists and psychologists who, who are doing experimental work. Um, one of the speakers at this year's Summer Institute, Kalina Kristoff, who is a, a cognitive neuroscientist from the University of British Columbia, <clears throat> she and I are collaborating. She's doing research. She's interested in, in spon what would in psychology be called spontaneous cognition or things like mind wandering, daydreaming. And she's very interested in the kinds of ways that uh, uh, long-term meditators in certain meditative traditions may be able to describe the spontaneous arising of a thought with some precision because of their mental training. So I've been working with her collaborating on possible uh, experiments that are, are now starting to be run in her on, in her lab on this subject. So I, I collaborate with psychologists and neuroscientists. My, I'm, I'm a philosopher by training. And then I have a personal commitment to, to, contemplative, to contemplative practice. Um, I've, I've practiced in, in, in different contexts over the years. And I was raised in the 1970s uh, at an organization called the Lindisfarne Association, yes. um, which was uh, an earlier attempt to bring together scientists and contemplatives and artists as well, mm -hmm. uh, philosophers. Um, Headed up by your father. Headed by my father. William yes. Irwin Thompson. William Irwin Thompson, that's yes. right. So, yes. so you grew up meditating? Or? I, grew up, I grew up meditating as uh -huh. much as you know a, a kid is likely to do, but I was mm -hmm. taught meditation at a very young age, yeah. and it was part of my worldview. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had uh, resident Buddhist teachers and Sufi teachers and Hindu teachers, Christian teachers, so many contemplative traditions mm. represented. And mm. So I grew up in that milieu. So for me, um, my work when I went into academia as a philosopher, my work already was animated by that much larger spirit as, mm. as part of my upbringing. Mm. And so I, I see the Mind and Life Institute as very much a continuation of, of mm -hmm. what my father was trying to do with the Lindisfarne Association. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's a, you know, a, a quite strong personal continuity. Yes, wonderful. So say a little bit more, if you would, about Francisco Varela. You worked very closely mm -hmm. with Francisco. How, how did you meet him? And, and, uh... Well, I, I met him through my father in yeah. the Lindisfarne Association. Mm -hmm. he, um, he came to a conference that my father organized in 1977, I think it was. And um, he eventually came and was a scholar <coughs> in residence at the Lindisfarne Association. So I lived with him when I was a teenager. And my relationship to him was uh, he was he was like an older brother. We were very close. He was like an uncle. He was a mentor in many ways. And then later, as a graduate student, when I was uh, I had st I had studied Asian philosophy as an undergraduate. Uh, my first degree was was in Asian studies. Um, studied with Bob Thurman at Amherst. And then uh, when I went into graduate school in philosophy, I became very interested in cognitive science and the philosophy of mind. And uh, Francisco, at that point, was just starting to do some writing trying to bring together his thinking about Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist psychology. He was a, a Buddhist practitioner himself with his work as a neuroscientist. So this would have been around 1986 and he invited me to come to Paris and we worked together and then out of that work eventually we, we produced our book uh, with uh, later also with Eleanor Roche called The Embodied Mind mm -hmm. which was published in uh, 91. Mm -hmm. So I had a long history of, of working of working with Francisco that really went back to having known him as a as a teenager. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yes, I actually knew him in the early 70s, both Francisco mm. and um, Eleanor, uh -huh. as they were both studying with Trunk Right, of course, yeah. So, yeah. Um, what, what at this point is most exciting to you? <laughs> uh, well, the thing that excites me and that I'm working on now in my own work, um, writing, uh, writing a book about this topic, is the nature of consciousness. Um, and um, in my own work, I try to bring together uh, contemplative philosophy, let's say, uh, philosophy from Indian traditions, not just Buddhism, but also yoga and Vedanta, um, together with Western philosophy of mind and neuroscience, to try to get a richer um, perspective on the nature of, of consciousness, the nature of experience in waking states like attentive perception or mind wandering or mm -hmm. daydreaming. Um, what happens to consciousness when you start to fall asleep? What happens to consciousness when you dream? Uh, what happens to consciousness when you have a lucid dream, when you know you're dreaming? Mm -hmm. um, so this, I'm working on a book right now on this topic um, that will be published in 2012 by Columbia University mm, Press. Right. And uh, so this is what uh, has occupied me for a number of years. But the Mind and Life meetings are, are very rich for me in that way because a lot of the things that I'm thinking about in my own work are are able to be discussed here in a way that you know is not usually what you would find in a university um, setting. Certainly not, you know, in my day-to-day -day job as a professor, I, I get to work on some of this. But to come to a place like this with this huge, you know, uh, array of perspectives with very serious scientists and contemplatives is very enriching for that. Mm. Um, you're familiar with the work of Thomas Metzinger, mm -hmm. the German philosopher, and are you in touch with him? I am, yes. Mm -hmm. we, we, uh, we're colleagues and we, we, uh, we uh, see each other at conferences. We, we just actually did an event together this past December at the New York Academy of Sciences on, uh, on the self, the question of whether the self is an illusion. So he and I were participants as well as a cardiologist uh, from the Netherlands who works on near-death experiences named mm -hmm. Van Lommel. So uh, I see Thomas uh, a couple times a year, usually. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And he, he presents a very interesting theory. I forget what his term is, but this kind of global schema that the mind creates so that all mm -hmm. aspects can be accessed and kind of integrated. Mm -hmm. And that's what becomes the conscious experience of mm -hmm. self. Right, right. A and do you think that's, that's heading in the right direction? Or? Well, so, um, I mean, Tomas and I have all sorts of uh, places where we converge and places where we where mm -hmm. we diverge. Um, we're, we're interested in exactly the same things, which um, is not maybe normally the case in philosophy. He's very, uh, he's a serious meditation practitioner. He's very interested in meditative experience and what it can tell us mm -hmm. about consciousness. Um, he's interested in dreaming and lucid dreaming. Right. And, um, so we're interested in exactly the same things. Our take on them is somewhat different. Um, his approach is, at least as I see it, is really to try to um, translate these states into some way of understanding how they're directly implemented in, in the brain. Mm -hmm. So he's very much concerned with the neural basis, how a brain would generate a, a self-model, as he calls it, which right. would then um, give, us, uh, give us a sense of self. And um, I think that's part of the story, but my approach is more uh, what I would call an embodied approach. So for me, it's always very important to remember that the brain is in the context of a living whole living body and living organism mm -hmm. interacting with the environment. And to my way of thinking, he de-emphasizes that mm -hmm. in a way that I'm not comfortable with. Um, so we, you know, we disagree about this when we see each mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as I say, we're interested in, in very much the same things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how far are we from fully understanding the relationship of the brain and the mind? Oh, I'd say we've got some ways to go. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I mean, partly... F L lifetimes or...? Uh, uh, I think it's going to take a lot of, uh, of, of hard work, mm -hmm. and it's going to take some shifts in our thinking. Um, we're still very much, understandably in some ways, uh, hostage to the technologies we have available. Right. So when we have uh, fMRI scanners, we immediately start conceptualizing the brain in terms of these you know, images that we're able to produce, and we sort of for forget... Scientists themselves don't, but we tend to easily slide into a way of thinking about these images as maybe more than what they are, which is mm -hmm. these highly statistical constructs. They're not snapshots of what the brain is, is, is doing. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to need a much uh, you know, richer uh, and deeper uh, approach with multiple modes of investigation, drawing on phenomenology and, on, and not just neuroscience, but a broader uh, biological and, and ecological uh, 
perspective on the way that we're embedded in the world before mm -hmm. we're, we're, um, we're going to have a, a fuller uh, scientific sense. I think that work is tractable and doable, but I think it's going you know, to take some time. It's going to take many, uh, many generations, I would predict, mm -hmm. um, to, to really bring to its full, full flowering. Uh, right, and where this is the first or at most the second generation exactly. really exactly. Uh, undertaking this. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. William James wrote 100 years ago, and we're still not, he, he mapped out you know, a large amount of the terrain, mm -hmm. and we still barely begun to scratch the surface of what, you know, some of what he said. So I think you know, we've got a fair amount of time, mm -hmm. centuries still, mm -hmm. to keep working. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you thank very you. much.